is the second week of our series, Sync, uh, where we're discussing God, the Holy Spirit, and His role in our lives. Last week we learned about uh, the Holy Spirit's relationship uh, with the other two persons of the Trinity. Remember, that's one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. That's who we understand God from, from the Bible. Uh, throughout most of the 2,000 years of church history, the Holy Spirit has been the most neglected member of the Trinity, simply because people have misunderstood him. Prior to the 20th century, most Christians referred to him as the Holy Ghost. So that created a bit of confusion, because Christians are like, aren't ghosts evil? Wait, we shouldn't worship a ghost. Wait, oh, what is what God's a ghost? What, what is it? And uh, just from the wording, that created a lot of confusion. So most, Christ most Christians just didn't discuss the Holy Spirit much. Uh, in the early 20th century, the birth of the Pentecostal movement helped to bring the third person of the Trinity back into the light. Uh, he's still quite misunderstood, though. So that's why we're discussing the Holy Spirit in this series. So today's message is titled... Pull it up. The names of the Holy Spirit's right there on your top of your sheet. So the series Sync is about how to be synced with the third person of the Trinity. And uh, so today we're talking about the names of the Holy Spirit. Yes, there's more than one name uh, described in the Bible about the third person of the Trinity. Uh, most of this message I got directly from the excellent website, gotquestions.org. If you ever have a question about your faith, uh, Christianity, the Bible, you can uh, text your Ethan Groups leader or text me uh, if you have my number. Uh, but you can also find the answer for yourself from a great trusted resource like God Questions. Literally, all you need to type in Google is God Questions, and it's the first hit you get. It's right at the top. Uh, and then you just type in your question. Something like 400,000 plus questions about Christianity are answered uh, there on that website. It's an excellent resource uh, for all of us. Uh, our first passage on this uh, message named The Names of the Holy Spirit uh, is found in 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21. So write the location down and then follow along on the screen. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Uh, our understanding of this Scripture is that some of the prophets is referring to are the writers of the Bible, the writers. Uh, so from this, we're learning that the writers from 2 Peter uh, actually got their words from God, the Holy Spirit. So that leads us to our first name today of the Holy Spirit. He is the author of Scripture. Write that down. He's the author of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is inspired by God and the, uh, by God the Holy Spirit. You know, it's not just God. It's God the Holy Spirit who's doing the inspiring. 2 Timothy 3.16. Um, the actual word inspired, uh, the original Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in, uh, the Greek is actually theonoustos, which literally means God breathed. So the pages of Scripture are literally God's very breath. The Bible is not like other books. It's the only God-inspired book in existence. And all Scripture is inspired by God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moved every writer of the 66 books of the Bible to record exactly what he breathed into their hearts and minds. They knew what to write because the Holy Spirit inspired them to write it. The writers did indeed use their own perspective and style of writing. They weren't zombies as the Holy Spirit was inspiring them. But it's accurate to say that there is not a word in our Bible that God did not want to be there. Because of this, we know the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Write that down and underline the word inerrant. It means without error, completely without error. The Bible is perfect truth. Not all churches teach that, but here at Gold Creek, we do believe as a core principle that the Bible is the perfect inerrant word of God. Go on our website and look at our statement of beliefs. There's inerrancy. Very key belief, because from your view of Scripture, all your other views about God and faith uh, come from that. If you believe the Bible's full of mistakes, you're not going to hold the Bible uh, with as much authority 
as someone who holds it as the perfect inerrant word of God. And that means inerrancy teaches that the Bible is true in all of its, and everything it teaches. That includes its historical claims and its scientific claims. Uh, for instance, uh, a historical scientific claim uh, we read about in the Bible is when Joshua and the army of Israel fighting a great battle against one of their enemies. Um, the sun was about to go down and they needed to defeat the enemy. If the sun went down, the, the enemy could escape into the darkness and attack them at a later date, so they needed to defeat them. And so uh, the Is uh, Israelites prayed that God would stop the sun. And we read in Scripture that the sun actually stood still. So it was a longer than a 24-hour day. The sun stood still. The sun did not set for several hours so that they could defeat the enemies of God. Um, now, people would say, that's bad science. We all know if the, if a sun, if the sun or star of the solar system stopped, the solar system would collapse. The planets would fall out of orbit. But because we believe that God is all-powerful, he's omnipotent, all-powerful, he can hold the universe together. So yeah, we believe he could stop the sun without the universe falling apart. And we believe that's true. We don't believe that's just a Jewish fable that God stopped the sun. No, we think he literally did, because the Bible says he stopped the sun. That's an heresy. And we know the Bible is true because the Holy Spirit inspired it. It's not like other books. It's not just words of prophets, of men. No, it's God's very breath. Our next passage is John 15, 26. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. It says this, But I will send you the Advocate, the Spirit of Truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. Advocate. That's the next name that we learn from this passage for the Holy Spirit. He's an advocate for us. The Greek word, again, the, Old, uh, the New Testament was written in uh, Greek, and the Greek word for advocate is perikletos. Perikletos, and it can be translated as comforter and counselor, as well as advocate. That's what that word means. So the Holy Spirit is a comforter, a counselor, and an, and an advocate, someone who takes a stand for you. When we accept him as our personal Savior, Jesus promises to send us the Holy Spirit to live within us. The theological term is indwell, to live within us. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And he's going, and the Holy Spirit helps and guides us as believers. It is through the power and influence of the Holy Spirit that Christians are able to deny their sin nature and change into a new God-honoring person. That's why there's stories of drug addicts that have done drugs almost their entire life, and they're addicted to them. They can't stop. They hear the gospel proclaimed. They give their life to Jesus, and they're able to never touch drugs ever again. Doctors say that's impossible to stop cold turkey and go through major withdrawal. Well, yeah, without God, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And that's why there's people that are able to radically change into different people after they encounter Jesus. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit working in their lives that they're able to change. Apart from God, we cannot change ourselves. But with God, all things are possible. So the Holy Spirit's an advocate. Next passage is John 16, 8. This is also Jesus talking after the passage we just read in John 15. And when he comes, that's the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. So we know from this passage that the third name of the Holy Spirit is he's the convictor of sin. He convicts us of our sin. For the believer... That's a person who's accepted Jesus as their Savior. The Holy Spirit acts as a divine conscience. Raise your hand if you know what a conscience is. Yes. Any Disney fans out there? Jiminy Cricket? Yes. Most famous conscience of all time. Uh, everyone, unless you're a psychopath or a sociopath, uh, has a conscience. Even non-Christians. That's, that's something that helps you decide what is morally right and morally wrong. Uh, we all have that. We know... Before, even even non-Christians know it's wrong to steal from a convenience store. You have a conscience. But when you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, you get the gift of the Holy Spirit to live within you. And the Holy Spirit 
takes over your conscience. So thus, you get what we call a divine conscience, a godlike conscience. When a believer sins, the Holy Spirit convicts him or her of the sin, which in turn should lead to godly sorrow. So if you are a Jesus follower and you are sinning, walking in sin, there should be a point where you stop, where the Holy Spirit convicts you and says, stop, what you're doing is wrong. You are sinning against God himself. And you should get what's called godly sorrow. Not bad that you just did wrong or you sinned and did sin. I, I should do better than this for my own standards. No, no. You feel godly sorrow that you sinned against your Savior. You sinned against Jesus. That should convict you and give you. You guys know what I'm talking about? That, that, that kind of guilt gut feeling you feel when you've done something you know is wrong? That's godly sorrow. And godly sorrow should lead to repentance. Make sure you remember what repentance is. Or we make this illustration, we do this a lot in J.I., of walking in your sin, you're walking away from God. You're coming to this point where you feel godly sorrow. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin. You're like, what am I doing? I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to do this. I'm a Jesus follower. I'm sinning against Jesus. I can't do this anymore. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to turn my back on my sin. And I'm going to walk the way that Jesus wants me to walk. That is repentance. That's not falling into the same sin every other day. Jesus, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. 24 hours later, you're doing the same sin. Jesus, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, because Jesus, you have to forgive me of any sin. I know that's in the Bible. So please forgive me. Okay, I'm good. And I do the same thing. That is not the Christian lifestyle. That is not why Jesus came and died on the cross for us. That is not the Christian life. No. Repentance is what the Christian life is all about. Turning away. And yes, Jesus will forgive you of any sin you repent of and turn away from. That's true. But it's not going back. You see the difference? Versus the, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Going back to the same thing. When you repent, you're turning away and saying, I'm making a promise to myself and to God that I am not going to go back into that sin. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but you're not falling into the same sins over and over again. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are changing. So when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, that should lead to godly sorrow, repentance, and confession. Remember, repentance and confession are intrinsically linked. You can't separate the two. Confession is naming your sin to God. We talk about a lot about this in eco groups and accountability. It's naming your sin. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for swearing at my friend. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for looking at that website. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for disrespecting my dad. Naming the sin. That is saying, God, I'm guilty. That's why we name it to God. That's confession. In a spirit of repentance. It's not real confession if it's not followed by genuine repentance, genuine turning away from your sin. Otherwise, it's not true confession. Thus, for a genuine Christian, it should be impossible to experience real joy while you're over here, while you're living in sin. That should not bring you joy. If you're a real Jesus follower, you have the Holy Spirit in you, when you're living in sin, that should bring godly sorrow, not joy. It should be impossible for a real Christian to experience real joy while living in unrepentant, sinful lifestyle. You should be miserable if you're a real Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. When you're living in sin, it should make you miserable, not happy. And for that time while you're living in sin, that's known as carnality. A carnal Christian, so as being a carnal Christian. Carnal in the, in, in the Bible simply means fleshy, flesh-like. And we know, if you've come to J.I., you've heard, what's of the flesh? That's our sinful lusts, our evil desires come from the flesh, our old sin nature. That's the flesh. A carnal Christian. So yeah, it's, it's true that for a time, a, true, a real Christian can live in sin. They're going to be miserable and angry and mad. Ah, I'm mad at God. All you Christians, ah, I, can't, I can't believe I used to go to church. Ah. But you're angry. You're not happy in your sin. You're a carnal Christian. God is working on your heart to bring you back into repentance, to bring you back to himself. There's a scripture that I love. It says, God chastises or punishes those he loves. So the mark of a true believer is when you're living in sin, you're not happy and joyful about it. No, you're miserable. You're angry. You're a carnal Christian. And God will allow you to go through that, and he'll bring you around. He'll bring correction. He'll bring discipline. Because he loves you, he wants to bring you back into the fold, bring you back to himself. And I've known Christians like that, that have lived in sin for a time, for a few days, a few weeks, maybe even a couple months, and they are miserable. Carnal Christians are some of the most unhappy people you'll ever meet in your life. 
Because God is working on their life. He's punishing them until they finally submit and come back to him. Their life's not happy. And for some carnal Christians, uh, it may take a thing where you lose your job, you get fired, until God gets your attention. Hey, wake up. I'm not going to let you live this way anymore. I love you too much. You're hurting yourself. I'm not going to allow you to live like this. So I'll take your job away. Maybe that'll get your attention and bring you back to repentance. If that doesn't work, you may go a step further. It may be a thing where the person is so carnal and has such a hard heart towards God that they're not coming back, but they are truly a Christian, so God chastises, God punishes them because he loves them. They're one of his. He's like, I'm not going to let you live with this. I love you too much to allow this. It may be a situation where God allows them to get in a car accident, a serious car accident, where they get seriously injured and have to have surgery in the hospital. God will get their attention. It might be that serious of a thing where their life is almost taken from them until they finally turn back to God and repent. Carnality. But there's lots of people that call themselves Christians that aren't carnal Christians. Know why? Because carnal Christians, when they're living in sin, they're miserable. They're awful people. Just horrible people, bro. But there's people that call themselves Christians that are living in sin, and they're loving it. Sin is fun. I love this. I'm loving my sin. And they're not being punished. Like, what in the world? How's this person? Look how they're living. How are they... How are they getting all these things in their life? And how are things going on? They got promoted at their job. They're cheating on their wife and they got promoted. How is it? This person grew up in church. What? They call themselves a Christian. What on earth? My argument is that person, that's not a carnal Christian. The only thing that I can say, looking at scripture and seeing a person like that that lives in sin and has joy, they're loving it, and their life is going great seemingly, is that that person was never saved to begin with. Because when I see scripture, I see that God chastises those he loves. When he lets someone live that way, I'm thinking that person is not in the fold. That's not one of God's. It's not a Christian. They were never saved to begin with. Because if you have the Holy Spirit, he's going to convict you of your sin. He's not going to let you live in freedom and happiness in your sin. Next passage. Ephesians 1, 13-14. And now you Gentiles, that's a non-Jewish person, that's all of us, have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you, the gospel. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as one of uh, his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. So a mark of if you really belong to Jesus is that you're going to have the gift of the Holy Spirit living within you. That's what it's saying. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. He purchased us with the blood of his son, Jesus, on the cross. So from this passage, we see that the Holy Spirit, the fourth thing today for the Holy Spirit is he's the guarantee. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee on our life. He's God's seal on his people. You guys know what seal is? Back a couple centuries ago, when kings and important people like that had really important letters to send, letters, they're like notes with pens and like stamps, and 2015 students in 2015 have no idea what I'm talking about, that's okay. Text, email, are you seeing that? But no, like handwritten notes with stamps and stuff, what's that? Uh, I, I just sent like three thank you notes for my birthday yesterday, I'm like, I'm like, my students probably have no idea what this is. Anyway, uh, they would use these envelopes, these things called <laughs> envelopes. I hope somebody knows what an envelope is. Okay, okay. Stamps. Okay. Uh, <laughs> they'd write, so kings and dignitaries would send these really important memos. They didn't have email, they didn't have phones, and so they had to send these important correspondence by print, by mail, and they had to write them out. And uh, in order to make sure that it's not tampered with and that the person they send it to, very important letters, uh, make sure it's not messed with and opened up and peeked in and seen what's in there, they would put what's known as a seal on it. And like I said, a couple hundred, couple, uh, hundred years ago, what they would do is they would take uh, melted wax from a candle and pour it on the back of the envelope to seal the flap, to seal it. Okay? And then they would take their signet ring, like my college one right here, uh, with a seal on it, or a stamp with the king's signature on it, signet seal on it, whatever it is, royal, uh, royal shield, whatever you have. Uh, he would take it and he would stamp it in the wet wax. Now what happens when wax dries? It becomes hard. It seals it. It locks it. 
So, it becomes impossible to tamper with it without there being evidence that you tampered with it. If someone broke the seal and peeked in what's side, the person who's receiving the letter from the king or the dignitary or whatever uh, is going to know that it was messed with. This has been tampered with. This has been opened up. I'm not sure if I can trust this because it's been opened up. Okay? That's a seal. It's a guarantee. And the Holy Spirit, according to Scripture, is God's seal on you. That you belong to Jesus. The gift of the Holy Spirit to believers is a down payment on our gift of eternal life in heaven, which Jesus secured on the cross. Do you guys know what a down payment is? Um, Originally, if you live in a house, I live in an apartment, but if you live in a house, uh, when your parents moved into their house, they probably didn't pay the owner all cash. Okay? Typically, that's not done in America. Uh, unless you're a millionaire. Uh, no, they probably paid a down payment. That means a starting fee. Not the whole amount, but a starting fee so that you could move in there. Okay? That's a down payment. And the Holy Spirit is a down payment on our salvation. That the moment we die, we won't go and spend eternity in hell separated from God. Instead, because we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, we'll get to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. That's our salvation. Eternal life in heaven with Him. The seal of the Holy Spirit gives us assurance of our salvation. That is why when I say that you can leave this building today knowing 100% conviction that you are are a Jesus follower, that you are saved from your sin and spend eternity with Jesus. The moment you'll die, you'll be in the presence of Jesus. You can know that with complete certainty. Why? Because the Holy Spirit. He's the seal. A lot of young people doubt their salvation, though. I went through a time that, uh, when I was your age, all the way through college, where I was like, I know I prayed the sinner's prayer, but I'm just not sure. Am I really saved? Am I not? I'm just not sure. Did I pray it right? Uh, I don't want to know. Did I, did I really mean it completely? Anybody ever doubted their salvation before, like I did? Yeah, a couple of you? Yeah. Um, you can know for sure. You don't have to doubt your salvation. You can know for sure if you have evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's how you can know for sure. Because he's the seal on the Christian's life. That's what gives you the guarantee that you belong to Jesus, that you'll get to spend eternity with him in heaven. Romans 8, 9. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature anymore. This is talking to a Christian. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. So this leads us to our fifth name for the Holy Spirit, the indweller of believers. What's, what's a dwelling? Dwelling place, place you live, right? A dwelling. So what do you think indwelling means? To live within, to live inside. The Holy Spirit lives within believers. He's the indweller of Christians. The Holy Spirit resides in the hearts of Christians, which is, as we just said before, the mark of a true believer. How do we know we have the Holy Spirit? He changes us. We're going to talk more about this in a couple weeks, about the fruit of the Spirit, what results when you have the Holy Spirit, the evidence in your life that you're saved, that you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit directs, guides, comforts, and influences us, as well as producing the fruit of the Spirit. This change from the Holy Spirit all comes from within. See, when we try to clean ourselves from the outside in, that leads to legalism. Well, I do this, I do this, I do this, and then maybe I'll become spiritual. No, 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 no. It's the other way around. Change starts from the inside out, because that's where the Holy Spirit dwells. It all starts with the Holy Spirit. By ourselves, we cannot change one bit. We cannot move towards God one bit without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because our bodies are the home of the Holy Spirit, we should be honoring God with them at all times. That's why last month we were going through our Ten Commandments series. We talked about the, the importance and the severity of sexual sin and how sexual sin is on a completely different level than other sins. Why? Because you're sinning against your own body when you commit sexual sins. And who lives within our bodies? J.I. who lives within us. Who's the indweller? The Holy Spirit. So when you commit sexual sin, lust, whatever it is, you're directly sinning against God, the Holy Spirit. Sounds serious, because it is. You're directly sinning against God himself, because he lives within you. So the question to you is this, are you honoring God with your body today? 
If you are Jesus' follower, you have the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, you can tell people that I have God living within me. What do you mean? How do you mean? What do you mean you have God living within you? Because I have the Holy Spirit. He dwells every believer and helps us to change and live for Jesus. But also, you should take that seriously to remember that I need to be treating my body with respect and honor because it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Next passage is Romans 8, 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. What we're seeing here is the Holy Spirit does intercessory prayer for us. Intercessory prayer is praying for someone other than yourself. Talks a lot about uh, how I've grown a lot in the last few years uh, since I've been at Gold Creek in my prayer life, in my personal prayer life. Hasn't been for praying for myself. No, it's because I've learned how to pray for others, following, following the example of the Holy Spirit. Not praying just for myself, but praying for others. Intercessory prayer. So that leads us to our sixth title for the Holy Spirit. The, he's the intercessor. According to Romans 8, when we don't know how or what to pray for, have you ever been like that? I just don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray for. Raise your hand if you've ever had trouble praying. Yeah, I just, I don't really know. What, what should I pray for? I talk about my eighth grade deacon groups guys a lot about this. And, you know, my, my guys a lot of times will pray. And we'll, we pray every week. And it'll be a prayer like, dude, you just help me to get an A on the test that I didn't study for. I'm like, do you have anything else to pray for? Nope, that's it. I'm good. I'm like, ah. um, cute for an eight-year-old to pray like that? Not so cute for a 14-year-old to pray like that. And we're always encouraging guys to develop a healthy prayer life and to grow in your prayers, to go deeper in your prayer life. Um, so a lot of middle schoolers, I think if we're honest, a lot of middle schoolers have trouble praying. Well, have you ever thought of asking the Holy Spirit to help you pray? Bring to mind what I should pray for, who I should pray for? Are you being an intercessor for other people? Are you praying for other people or are you just praying for yourself? Maybe like myself, your prayer life will grow when you stop focusing on yourself and start focusing on other people's needs. And trust me, in middle school, there's tons of people in your school that need prayer. Ask them. Pray for one. Pastor Dan talks about it all the time. When we don't know how or what to pray for, we should ask him for help. But also, when we don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit, according to Romans 8, intercedes to the Father on our behalf. So the third person of the Trinity prays to the first person of the Trinity for you. That's pretty cool. I don't think of myself as anything great about my prayer life. I don't think I have an awesome prayer life or I don't think I'm very good at praying. So that's cool to know that when I forget what to pray for and I don't say the right words, that the Holy Spirit is, is kind of covering the basis for me. He's praying to the Father for me. And as he lives within us, and we know that God knows us better than you know yourself, nobody in here knows how many hairs on your head, do you? Nobody knows that? Yeah. I don't think anyone knows that. Guess who knows how many hairs on your head? The Bible tells us. God does. So God knows you better than you know yourself. He knows you better than your mother knows you because he created you. And because the Holy Spirit lives within us, he can interpret when we need God's help better than we can. Say you're walking in sin. You're walking, you're not confessing your sins. You're, you're cut off from God because of your sins. You haven't prayed in a while. You haven't read your woman the Bible. You haven't gone to eco groups. You're just kind of walking out on your own, walking in sin. You're not going to recognize when you need help, when you need God's help all the time. And so there's times, there's moments where the Holy Spirit sees you need help. And he'll pray to the Father for you in times of distress, when you need help, even when you don't realize you need help, and that you need to be calling out to God. That's very encouraging. Very encouraging. The next thing is found in 1 Corinthians 2, 12-15. And we have received God's Spirit, not the world's Spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. Those are the two key words for this passage. You see it? Spiritual truths. 
So this is why when I tell you guys to share the gospel with your friends at school, I pray that God gives you the words to say. This is what I'm talking about. I didn't even know I could talk like that about the gospel before. It wasn't you. It was the Holy Spirit speaking through you to your friends. These are the things you should be praying about for yourself. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them. They can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual, Christians, can understand what the Spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others or non-Christians. We should not be judged by those who aren't Christians. Now, I don't get why you guys do all that prayer stuff. Yeah, I expect you to say that you're not a Christian. Not, I would expect you not to get it. The Bible talks about why you don't get it. So this leads us to our seventh name for the Holy Spirit today. The Spirit of Truth. Write it down. Believers who have the Holy Spirit indwelling them are able to understand truth according to this passage, especially in spiritual matters in a way that unbelievers or non-Christians cannot understand. In January, I went to the movie Unbroken. You might see it over Christmas break, Unbroken. Yeah? Uh, it's a story about Louis Zamperini, a World War II hero. Uh, in the movie, uh, they, they depict what happened uh, when his plane crashed uh, in World War II in the Pacific Ocean and how for over a month he was uh, floating in the Pacific Ocean in the middle of nowhere, how uh, uh, only he and one other crew member survived, all the other crew members died on the plane, um, and uh, how sharks are trying to eat them. Uh, they're in storms, they almost drowned. And at one point, uh, Louis Zamperini cries out to God in his distress. He says, God, if you deliver me from this, if, if, if I survive this, I'll give my life to you and live for you for the rest of my life. He made a promise to God out on the Pacific Ocean. And uh, one day, a Japanese plane comes and shoots at them. So not only are they having to avoid sh sharks, they're having to avoid bullets from uh, Japanese aircraft. And then eventually, uh, after, after over a month, starving and almost dead, uh, a Japanese uh, worship picks them up in the air. Uh, then it gets worse. He goes into a prison camp where he's tortured for years. Uh, but God delivered him. He survives. But Louis Zamperini forgot his promise to God. He went back to living in California. He got married. His marriage was falling apart. And there came a point in time where this wasn't actually in the movie. Um, they actually skipped this part. Uh, to just a slide with text. They didn't actually really go into it. They didn't really show it too much. But in the book that Louis Zamperini wrote, he actually depicts this and talks about this in depth, about the actual book I'm broken, um, about his conversion. And what happened was uh, his wife went to go hear the famous uh, evangelist Billy Graham. Has anybody ever heard of Billy Graham? He's probably the most famous Christian of the 20th century. He's still alive, actually. Uh, it's been said that Billy Graham has spoken to more people in history than any other person throughout history. He's spoken to more people than anyone in history, including presidents. Um, something like 20 million people or something he's spoken to in his life. And uh, hundreds of thousands of people have come to a relationship with Jesus through uh, Billy Graham's ministry. Well, Louis Zamperini and his wife were two of them. Um, so Louis Zamperini and his wife went to this Los Angeles crusade, and they had these tents. And back in the day, what they would do, I think it was the late 40s, early 50s, they would have these revival meetings with these tents, and people, thousands of people would come every night, and they'd stay for a couple weeks. And so one of these nights in Los Angeles, his wife went. She got saved. She met Jesus. She came home and said, Louie, I want you to go to this with me. He's like, I don't want to go to a church thing. I don't need those preachers. Remember, he didn't keep his promise to God. And uh, forgot all about it. Uh, and he's like, I don't want to go. She goes, you need to go to this. Our marriage is falling apart. You need to go. So he went. And uh, she kind of drug him there. And uh, he said, as soon as I heard, I, I heard this, this interview of him. He goes, as soon as I heard Billy Graham and his preachers start talking about sin and how sin cuts us off from God and how we need a Savior to save us from our sin, he goes, he goes I have stormed out of the tent. I left. I just walked right down the aisle. I got out of there. I don't need no preacher telling me I'm a sinner. I already know I'm a sinner. That's what he said. And uh, so he, he hated it. And his wife came back and said, she goes, Louie, you need to go with me to this. You promised you'd go to this, not walk out halfway through. You need to go back tonight with me. He goes, no, I'm not going. I'm never going back there. I don't care about your church stuff. I don't need your God and your Jesus. She goes, Louis, you either go to me or I'm leaving you. <laughs> and so he goes, I love my wife. I was a horrible husband, but I loved her. And I didn't want her to leave me, so I decided to go. So he went back the second night. And he goes, right as I was about to walk out again, he goes, I got up to leave. And he goes, God brought to his mind the 
promise he made for him on the Pacific Ocean, that if you save my life, God, I'll live for you the rest of my life. He remembered his promise for the first time since then, and he went up to the altar, the stage, and he accepted Jesus as a Savior. And he said, out of that, immediately he began getting this hunger for truth. And he decided to look for a Bible. He didn't own a Bible. He goes, the only Bible I had was my New Testament that the army gave me. And I go to my footlocker when I got home and find it, dug it out and found it. I just started reading it. And he said he grew up a Catholic, and so he read the Bible before as a kid, but it never made sense to him. He didn't understand it. But he starts reading it. He's a brand new baby Christian. And he goes, immediately I started to uh, understand God's truth. It started making sense. I didn't understand everything, but he goes, most of it I was getting. I was getting the major points. And before I read the Bible, I never understood before. So the blinders were taken off. The blinders were removed. Now, he didn't go to a Bible college and get a Bible degree, did he? No. What's the only difference from the last time he read the Bible to after he got saved? What's the only difference in his life? He has what now? Not an education. Does he have what? But he's got the Holy Spirit now. He's got the spirit of truth living within him. And the Holy Spirit removed his blinders. And now he can actually read the truth for himself and understand it. He can read God's word and understand it. That's what this is talking about. 1 Corinthians 2. It's the Louis Zamparina story. In our last name for the Holy Spirit today, there are more of them. This isn't an exhaustive list, but this is all we have for, for, because of time today, is eight of them. And this one we found in Romans 8, 2. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. He's saying because you're a Jesus father, you belong to Jesus. So because you have the Holy Spirit, he's freed you from the power of sin. See, the spirit frees us from enslavement to our sin nature. We learned about this in the Ten Commandments series last month. Oh, you Christians got all these rules. No, these rules are meant to free us from our sin nature. You guys got it backwards because you don't have the Holy Spirit. You're blind to the spiritual truth. The reality that those who don't have Jesus 